Hi, this is David Cook, author of Seven Days in Utopia. We're right here at the driving range, the old driving range in Utopia where this all started several years ago. Welcome, and we appreciate you being here. Some of you guys just read the book, others of you watched the film, and you've shown up today looking for the answer to the question, did he make the putt? And um, as you notice, this is not some big Hollywood production. What we're trying to do here is, is, is engage you in what it's like to be in Utopia. It's a very simple place, but it's also profound because of its simplicity. To give you the answer to did he make the putt, I'm gonna do something today. I'm gonna give you a sneak preview and read the first chapter of the sequel to Seven Days in Utopia that answers the question. And if you listen carefully, you're gonna hear more than maybe the answer that you came for, did he make the putt? I know this. Everybody that's gone to the movie and everybody that's read the book, they're looking for more in their life. And hopefully you found that when you watched the movie or read the book. Today is the next step in your journey. So let's go on over to the cemetery where I'm gonna read the first chapter of the sequel, Seven Days in Utopia. I heard my name over the makeshift loudspeakers as the tournament director hoisted the trophy in my direction. In the midst of this surreal scene of crazed underdog fans, mixed with those disappointed by the fall of their champion, I reached for the trophy, feeling both like a hero and villain. I was being anointed by a world obsessed with putting people on a pedestal. And when a man receives it, unbeknownst to him, he accepts the public exposition that comes from the inevitable great fall. We live and perform on the stage before a sick voyeuristic media of hidden faces, hiding in the shadows of each tragic demise. It was one week ago Sunday that Johnny had helped me understand that no man was made for a pedestal. That spot had been reserved before the beginning of time for one. No man can carry the weight of glory, nor is he supposed to. All champions fall when talent fails to hold up under the pressure or when age or death eventually prevails in this mortal state. And when it happens, early or late, another is anointed and the cycle proceeds. There's nothing so sad as watching a champion fade. A.E. Hausman, in his poem, To an Athlete Dying Young, said it best. Now you will not swell the rout of lads that wore their honors out, runners whom renown outran, and their name died before the man. Sensing the birth of a revolution, the crowd erupted in raucous applause as my fingers touched the cool, polished bronze boot that served as the crown at this, a most unsuspected coronation. Wasn't I just an average kid from Central Texas? And wasn't it just two weeks ago that I was just another nameless face on the mini tours immersed in a devastating crash and burn scene? What I discovered was that to a world starved for a hero, anonymity served as a seed of hope. For an anonymity, there's no disqualifying baggage, no sense of mortality in the emerging king. At that moment, life stood still as I contemplated deeply what had just happened. Life sometimes turns on a razor's edge and for me, it had been a fork in the road. So often, at day's end, we stare at the back of a tapestry of our lives, trying to make sense out of the meaningless meandering of the thread. And then one day it happens. Through a messenger or experience, we hear the clear voice of God calling us to take a peek at the other side of the tapestry. And when we do, we're undone by the beauty of the story being woven and the meaning of a life of inconsequential coincidences emerging into an epic adventure with a purpose and calling worth living for. The microphone was handed to me and the potential revolutionaries awaited their call. In an instant, my words had weight and never before had my words carried much meaning. I had a moment to think, what could I say that would serve as a seed for their journey? Anxiety crept in and cotton hung thick from the roof of my mouth. And then just as I was about to speak, I heard the call of a flock of geese overhead. And as I looked up, I couldn't help but wonder why they were so late in their migration north. And then I heard the voice, the same voice I had experienced when I heard the knock of destiny on the green. The voice simply said, tell the crowd what you see. A peace settled over me, and these words streamed forth, feeling like a cool drink of water from a heavenly source. When I was a kid, I loved the sounds of spring. I would lay in the emerging grass, with my dog staring into the sky, hoping to catch a glimpse and sound of geese heading north. And they would fly in formation on their quest to find the nest for the birth of the next generation. And one goose always led in the V formation while all others flew in the wake of his lead. And at this, 
The honk of the geese trumpeted loudly, causing everyone to turn their heads skyward. I paused to let the moment set in. And then I continued. There may be no tradition greater than an innate urge to migrate in the early spring. It is obvious these geese have broken tradition. And though they may seem late, nevertheless, they have a destiny, and so do you and I. Today I will take the lead in this unconventional migration, knowing that this victory may inspire others in my wake. However, I will not receive the champion's pedestal. I am but a child of the one who carries the title of champion. Two weeks ago, I was an also ran in the mini tours, immersed in one of the greatest collapses of my life, and I choked my guts out. In an attempt to escape, I drove deep into the hill country of Texas, eventually coming upon a fork in the road, and I chose to turn left towards a small village of Utopia, not knowing that it would change my life. And at sunset that evening, I met a man named Johnny who called me out, challenging me to be a revolutionary. I spent a week with him emerging with a new heart. And while he taught me the lost wisdom of the game, the most significant thing he did was to introduce me to a new voice in my life, the voice of the true migration. I don't know how to say this well because I'm new at this, but this victory was the start of a revolution for me. And when I took out the face on putter for the final putt, it had been but a symbol for what had been birthed in my soul in utopia. From this day forward, I will never follow tradition for tradition's sake. Instead, I endeavor to follow but one voice, and that is the voice of truth. Secondly, I refuse to play for acceptance because excellence is my coach. In closing, I know that there are two reasons for this victory. One is because I flew in the wake of Johnny's wisdom, and the second is because I knelt before the champion's throne in a cemetery far from this place. It was in this posture that I received my true purpose in life and the grace to bury the lies that had a chokehold on my talent. And when you walk in your purpose, a trophy pales in comparison to the fruit of your wake. And with this, I held the trophy toward heaven and the geese overhead and said, let the revolution begin. I know for a lot of you, today could be the start of a revolution in your life. And I'd like to invite you to bury your lies right here with thousands of other people that have sent them to us here in Utopia. If you'll just head back to the website and click on Bury Lies and send them this way, we'll bury them here with others. In the meantime, God bless you as you seek your dreams on this great sacred journey called your life.